Hey everyone, I'm in here with AI Plays. Today we're covering Color Filter Array Interpolation. Let's get started. To recap, so far we've covered how a camera converts light into a Bayer domain image, how to correct dead pixels, how to compensate for black levels, how to adjust for lens shading, what an anti-aliasing filter is and how to apply one, and finally how to apply auto white balance beam control. So far, we've always been working in the Bayer domain, specifically with RGGB images like this one. Additionally, you also know that although on this diagram you can see the red, green, and blue colors, the Bayer domain image is really a black and white array of brightness intensities. If we want to make a colorful image, every pixel needs a red, green, and blue brightness intensity to make a full RGB color image. To do that, We'll create an array of red pixels, an array of green pixels, and an array of blue pixels, each of the same size as the original Bayer domain image, and then stack them on top of each other on a third axis as shown on screen. However, since we are in a Bayer domain image, we obviously don't have the information of each color pixel at each point. Color filter array interpolation refers to a process of calculating approximate values for unknown color intensities using the surrounding known color intensities. The process is slightly different for each of the three channels, and we'll analyze each of them one at a time. Let's use this 4x4 section of an image for an example, and focus on creating a full red channel first. On this RGGB pattern, we already have red values for all of the red pixels. For green pixels on red rows, we can approximate the red value by taking an average of the surrounding right and left red pixels. For example, the red pixel at position G00 is the average of the values of R00 and R01, but that brings a problem. What about the values at the edges like G01? To solve this, we can apply reflect padding to the right. However, note that as a result of this, the red value of G01 just ends up being equal to the value of R01. We only apply padding and use this method to make the code flow smoother without having too many if statements to check edge conditions. Moving on to green pixels on blue rows, the process is nearly identical to green pixels on red rows, but instead of averaging horizontally, we can now average vertically. For example, the red value of G10 is the average of R00 and R20. Additionally, we again run into the same issue of edge values for G30, and we solve it in the same way, using reflect padding. Finally, blue pixels. When it comes to blue pixels, there are actually four red pixels surrounding each blue pixel. This means that instead of taking an average of just two pixels, we can compute the red value on blue pixels using an average of all four surrounding red pixels. For example, at B10, we can take the sum of R00, R01, R20, and R21, then divide by four. And once again, we have an issue at the edge pixel B31, which can be solved by completing the one by one reflect padding on the bottom and right sides. With that done, we now had red values for every pixel in the entire RGGB image. The next channel we'll look at is the blue channel. Once again, we already have all the blue values for the originally blue pixels. For green pixels on red rows, we'll use the opposite procedure to red channels. We can take an average of top and bottom blue pixels to estimate most values, so the blue pixel at G20 is an average of B10 and B30, and we can estimate edge values using reflect padding. Similarly, green pixels on blue rows will take an average of left and right blue pixels for most values, meaning the blue pixel at G11 is an average of B10 and B10. And again, we handle edge values with reflect padding. Finally, the blue pixel value on red pixels is also calculated very similarly to the red channel, taking an average of the surrounding four blue pixels with the appropriate padding. By the way, even though we don't technically need the top right and top left edges to be padded, for convenience in coding, we can just add them in to create a full one by one reflect padding. There's no harm in it. Lastly, we can work on the green channel. What's convenient here is that we already have all of the green values for both green on red row and green on blue row pixels. So we only need green projections onto red and blue, and both of them are averages of the surrounding four pixels of their respective colors. For example, the green value at B10 is an average of G00, G10, G20, and G11. At this point, we have three separate arrays of the same size as the original Bayer domain image called channels. To finalize the color image, we stack them dimensionally to put them into a format the computer is used to. Now let's have a look at how we can apply this in code. We start by defining the CFA function, which takes as input the Bayer domain, unsigned into 16, 
AWB image we created in the last video after auto white balance gain control. Our output will be an unsigned int 8 CFA image with all three color channels in the RGB domain. The code begins in a similar way to what we have seen so far, changing the D-type to allow for better processing and extracting the shape of the image for later interpolation. Then we create empty arrays for the red, green, and blue channels, each the same shape as the original Bayer domain image. Finally, we can pad the image with 1x1 one one reflect padding, and we can get started on the main loop. Also, we define the variable maxval, but it isn't really used until after the CFA. However, remember that all of the changes applied in the CFA are really just averages, so the maximum value in the original AWB image will also be equal to the maximum value after CFA. If we want to work on the pixel channels one at a time, it would require looping through the entire image three times. Instead, we bring back the for loop from black level compensation to identify if we are currently dealing with a red pixel, a green pixel on a red row, a green pixel on a blue row, or a blue pixel. Then we update the pixel value at this location from all three channels at the same time. By moving one pixel at a time instead of one channel at a time, we only need to loop through the image once. As a result of this though, we need to be very careful with the indexing to make sure we can properly specify which pixel we want to work with at any given time. To quickly review how the loop method worked, we identified what type of pixels we were dealing with by using the modulo operator to determine if the row and column indices were even or odd. Let's begin by looking at red pixels. If you're currently looking at a red pixel, then the red value can be just read off the image. The green value is an average of the pixels up, down, right, and left, while the blue value is an average of the pixels to the top right, top left, bottom right, and bottom left. Green pixels at red rows have their green values read directly off them, but red and blue values can be computed with surrounding averages. The same process works for green pixels at blue rows. Finally, for blue pixels. As you may have guessed, the code looks almost identical to the red pixels. As I mentioned earlier, the major point to remember and look out for is the indexing, and if you're careful with that, you should be fine. Now we can finally use MaxVal to clip the three channels, just to ensure they are all within an appropriate range. Then we can use np.dstack to dimensionally stack the three channels. Finally, we can rescale the image to np.uint8. The way this works is by dividing all values in the image by the maximum value, this gives you an array where each point is a percentage of the maximum value found in the image. The new maximum value is 1 and all other points are floating points. When you multiply this new array by 255, you get floating point values ranging from 0 to 255. Finally, the numpy as type command will round all of the values to integers. Now it takes a bit to run, but you can see it does properly generate colors. The image is overall quite dim, but we'll address that in the next few modules. Also, notice you don't need to specify the CMAP, which stands for color map, to gray anymore, since we're now working with an RGB image. Lastly, I want to highlight the effectiveness of our module so far. This is the CFA image you just saw, applied after all of the other modules in order. And this is the CFA image applied to the raw bare domain image. You can see a pretty clear difference. Without the proper transformations and setup, Color filter array interpolation creates a kind of purple and green tint to the image, along with other distortions throughout. That's it for today. Next time we'll cover gamma correction. Have a good day everyone.